Dr. Boz, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Well, thank you so much, Ben. We've been counting down to this since we well, we met again this past summer. So thank you, thank you for keeping me on the schedule. No, thank you for being here. My audience loves your work. Uh, they're always asking me, when are you going to interview Dr. Boz? When are you going to interview? Today's the day, Keto <laughs> Campers. We got her. <laughs> so if you're listening on the podcast, you hear her voice. If you're watching on YouTube, you see her here in front of you. We, we met in person at uh, KetoCon really briefly in Austin, Texas, and then we got to spend some more time together in Orlando at the Keto Orlando Summit. Uh, we actually, you know, you went on stage, I went right after you, which was super cool. I got to see you in action, and I just love your message. I love your authenticity. I love how you get to the root cause. You're not chasing symptoms. You're just a rock star. So wow. thank you for being here today. <laughs> Well, you can say pioneers back to medicine. Like you look at many physicians that go into the world of healthcare saying, you know, I've been on the side where you interview medical students and you say, why do you want to be a doctor? And they are the most motivated. They have philanthropy. They have drive. They have compassion. They have empathy for their community. And then it's like we squish that out of them as they become mm. doctors, <laughs> that something happens to every one of my classmates and to me when you get in the business of medicine, that finding finding people back on the side where we don't have to make it so darn complicated. It can be a lot easier in caring for people and as lovely as and privileged as it is to write prescriptions in the 21st century, they don't fix as much as we thought they did. Mm. Yeah, well said. And then I have I have a lot of respect for for doctors and practitioners who first start off during that conventional route, allopathic care. And there's a time and place for it, right? But they kind of see the writing on the wall. We're we're treating things after the fact, after the fact. What if we did something to just prevent that from ever happening? And they make that 180 decision like you did, and you know, Dr. Fung and other people out there, Dr. Barry. And I I just have so much respect for that because once you see that truth, that's one thing to be aware. And then the second thing is, do I change my practice? Do I change everything that I've been taught? Like Oof. I've been telling patients to do this and I've been writing these prescriptions, but there's a different way. Do you go down that direction? I mean, how difficult was it for you to make that decision? You know, it's very interesting you mentioned that today because over the past uh, month, I did something that I've never done before. And I took 200 students through what I call an intense metabolic um, kick, like boost their metabolism. And in that class, there were several physicians. And I was curious, like, wow, I mean, I want to know this stuff. And I really want to, like, apply this in that, my practice. But I was very curious to see what kind of physician would be interested in a course on how do you treat keto? How do you keto treat people or at least <laughs> metabolically enhance them uh, through this time? And as I got a couple of them on uh, private calls afterwards, just asking what they thought of the course and what they, uh, what feedback they had, did they like it? Uh, they all were hoping, <laughs> saying, I'm looking for a way to, you know, I, I got better through a ketogenic diet. I got better through this metabolic stuff. I, I can't believe how much of a difference it made in my own health. And I, I want to figure out how to transition to this. <laughs> and I said, hold hold your uh, ideas, zip your lips a little. Let me tell you what happens when you step outside the circle. I mean, mm. as you in an allopathic model, uh, the number of uh, peer reviews that I've had, to, I've had to sit through saying, yes, I did stop his statin. Yes, I did know that his LDL cholesterol was 180 and I stopped his statin. There was, you know, the, the process of going against the grain, of going against the guidelines, even though in the chart you can say they had muscle pain or you can find a, a reason that would med you know, medically shouldn't be challenged. When you are the lone wolf outside of the pack, it is easy to be attacked. And I said, do not st step in that direction and put your name on the line until you are really sure that's what you want to do. Because once advice. you're there, you can't go back. Mm. And you know, I, I, re I really empathize with what they're struggling with because I remember this choice point as well that you don't have the um, blinders on anymore once your own health is improved. And you know, I think having a little insight into being an independent physician, not being part of a corporate uh, medicine for you know, a good dozen years before my mom's cancer really got bad, and I had to like stop the music, say I'm gonna be a good doctor to one patient over this next year. I'm going to say no to everything else except this one patient. 
and it was terrible. That's totally against what my, you know, Midwestern work hard. Um, the, the harder you work, the more valuable you are. I was doing it for one person this whole year. And it's not like the clinic closed. I just had to say no a lot to, to be that present for my mom in her care. And, and the Band-Aid pulling off of what, how sick she really was and what happened when we switched the fuel inside her cells and then how alive she was inside that you couldn't see when she was that sick. You can't unsee it. You can't go back and say, oh, if this was my mom, how, how many other of my patients are hidden behind a Mm. brain fog or chronic infl inflammation or prescription medications that I said, take that Prozac, it'll improve that, you know, serotonin by 10% and you're going to feel 4% better. Mm. And then know that that isn't anything like what happens when you change the fuel inside all their cells. So I, I think when I look at the transition out of that, um, that traditional path, I don't abandon prescriptions. I think there is a place where I can study patients well, I can write prescriptions in a way that does bridge them. I think the most valuable part of bridging these two worlds is learning not to overpromise on either one and then recognizing that if you're a lone wolf, if you like isolation, if you want your, um, your health to be super private, then you probably should go with one prescription at a time and one doctor visit at a time. But one of the one of the other blessings that I think really wove into my history and wove into how the transition to serving outside of traditional medicine has just been, I couldn't have planned it this good actually, was my favorite organ is the brain. Um, so I'm an internal medicine doctor. I do bread and butter internal medicine, but repairing broken brains has always been this underlying, from the first patient I saw, I, you know, from the first moment I said, I'm not going to be an ICU physician. I'm going to be a mom that does outpatient only. And I'm going to, I'm going to work at peak brain performance is what I care to do the most of. Well, there is no clinic that does peak brain performance. At least there wasn't in 2001. And so primary care, internal medicine, but really a constant drive to say, how do you get their brains to work better? Mm. And this lent uh, a, a path towards uh, taking care of a, a of depression, taking care of Parkinson's, taking care of um, psychotic episodes, but then taking care of a, a an ocean filled with addiction. Mm. Now, riddle a brain, sex, drugs, rock and roll will, okay, drugs and rock and roll will, <laughs> will just be, a, you know, the quickest way to, to just pummel that brain and repairing it has so many psychological and spiritual conversations that I don't, I don't think there's another place in medicine that you can really have those three pillars of mind, body, and spirit that, yes, I can write prescriptions that will make their brains better. But when they have a haunting childhood of um, being shamed for being obese or eating in secrecy because that's what they had to do, and then they never tell you that that's what they're doing. And in order to fix that problem, you also have to recognize that their spirit is probably broken. And that, if I leave spirit out of it, if I don't even bring up the fact that, you know, you know, how do we heal all three parts of you, then I can get them better for a while. But they, I mean, almost all of them relapsed if they didn't find a way to honor a higher power and put that in their language again. And that is absolutely, as much as you might hear that the first year of medical school, that, you know, spirituality is important to the patient. Okay, I don't think I ever heard it again <laughs> in any other place, but that first introduction lecture of, you know, the biopsychosocial model of a patient. And then it just kind of is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get to the mechanism of action of how that antibiotic works when you give that chemotherapy drug. Kind of like nutrition, right? They probably meant sprinkle it in and they forget about it. Absolutely. And so to, to watch when, when you say a physician wants to enter this world uh, of, you know, non-traditional medicine, I just think there's a lot of things that the theory of making great doctors had the idea we should all learn some of these things like nutrition, like the spirituality of patients. But we all got focused on, you know, how do you pass the tests and do a good job of the, you know, the ICU patient that's crashing in front of you. And the nuances about how to journey somebody back to health 
is um, I think it's in my practice of peak brain performance, there was an arm of my practice that was addiction medicine. And they had a group every week that was free because if we didn't put them in group, they all failed. And what we learned was, and you're trying to teach adults how to behave differently. Uh, the prescriptions are nice, but they need to watch another human being who's screwing it up just like they are. And for the first time, see it in themselves. Mm. And, and that's, that's when you know you're making a difference. That's when you're like, oh, that's, that's what you want to capture with somebody as they're, you know, learning about how to heal themselves through, you know, what is a better metabolism? What is better mechanics? What is a better prediction of longevity? Um, but you can, you can tell them what to do in, in uh, your prescription pad or even in some of the, the things you're telling them to eat. But to get people to stay in a consistent pattern of eating that isn't so dopamine rewarded, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, you know, I have I have a, a lot of. Um, I want to unpack that real quick. So, I only could come from my perspective when it comes to the addiction part. I am by no means an addiction expert, and I don't have the experience that you have when it comes to addiction. But I want to hear your thoughts on my thoughts when it comes to what I did for my addiction. So, growing up, I used to have addictions to sugar, video games, drugs, and I was putting all of this energy and bandwidth into toxic behaviors. But then I went through rock bottom and depression and suicide, which opened up actually a purpose for me. And I started to uncover what's important to me, which was learning about nutrition, learning about health, getting the message out to the world. So what I did is I took all of the energy that I was using in those bad behaviors, addictive behaviors, and I transferred it into studying and video content and speaking on stage and all these crazy, amazing things that I'm doing. So I look at it as a transfer of energy and kind of, it was a superpower that I had, but I was using it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Now I'm using it for the right reasons because I'm clear on my purpose. Now, I don't know if that's accurate, but that's where I'm coming from. And I want to hear your thoughts. I would hire you any day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you look at uh, when people are broken, they will put so much energy into a path that is giving them some sort of reward. It's giving them some sort of relief. And, you know, I, I like to think of, um, you know, something that people think is, um, is not them. Um, and it sounds ridiculous when you first explain that somebody will cut themselves to feel better. Mm. And you're like, what, what do you mean? Why would they do that? And you, you look at, especially when somebody is, in a transition stage from uh, childhood to adolescence, that their brain is growing really quickly during a very special two or three years of their life. And so I would actually, um, I mean, we can take your case for an example. Like, do you recall what your, what your life was like at about the age of uh, 11 or 12? And what- Yes, I, I was overweight, I was bullied, I picked on, wore t-shirts inside of swimming pools, low self-esteem, no girlfriends. Video games right. all the time, yeah. Okay, so it's a, absolutely, in that time, especially a boy brain is very easy to predict when the length of their hippocampus is growing in uh, exponential, it's really fast growth of their hippocampus, that um, it, is, it also wires with how they feel about themselves uh, during that time when that growth is really, really rapid. So uh, I, I think it's the, the root of every great movie, the adolescent going through some traumatic struggles and how that empowers them for the rest of their life. And you look at uh, the pain that, th that was caused in your life at that time where uh, being accepted, uh, being judged by the outside look of you, um, and then not having uh, a strong enough uh, voice from a mentor, or at least one that could appreciate how horrible that was. Uh, so you were lonely. There's a lonesomeness in that. And when you when you look at how much of the wiring in uh, in getting pleasure from a few things that you were able to see dopamine surge, like they won in a video game, they ate high um, high sugar foods with small particle sizes. Boom! That's going to surge that dopamine, and they hit it again, hit it again, hit it again. And it, it is just like a drug that as soon as that um, that dopamine is 
exhausted in the first like wave of their addiction, the next wave, they don't get as much. So they try to do it more. And the next wave, they don't get as much. And they try to do it more. And the brain never gets this time to really heal and, and restore all those neurotransmitters, the ones that are causing them to feel good. So they just pummel that brain again and again and again. And as you watch people heal outside of that rapid learning curve, the, the, there are some really important moments that to, to be able to even describe yourself during that time with ease, meaning you can you can imagine yourself, you can see yourself, but almost as a third, you know, a, a bird's eye view, a, a different person watching your previous self, the act of of having empathy for that version of you is a skill set that is that is only accomplished in a mature brain. And many people can't do it without the assistance of somebody saying, do you recognize how how difficult that was for you, how lonesome that was, how how wouldn't you want to go help that kid? And it's in that moment where you can see yourself in the pain you've had and then transfer that to say, how can I, how can I give to that kid today? How can I be that version of the hero that I needed in today's world? Mm, that's good. And it, it, it will not give you the dopamine on the first time you do it, but it fuels that connection of what what was their hurt? What was their, you know, their their trauma? Uh, and then finding a way to weave into that story a purpose going forward. And when I look at the the you know thousands of addiction patients that um, some that hit sobriety, some that write me a letter every Christmas saying I don't think anybody could have walked through that with us with me. I you know so thankful for their life after. Uh, really finding what recovery means, and and I always think it's not it's not it's so there's there's a little bit of magic in the moments where a patient learns um, how how powerful the drug of a, of dopamine can be when they're hurting, and then if they don't find another way to to find a more sustainable production of that, the addiction will haunt them. They will come back. Uh, they will, your brain remembers uh, when people say, you mean I can't drink alcohol ever again in my whole life? I'm like, you know, let's not talk about that because it doesn't, it, it, the, the, the answer of why do you want that? You want to feel that good mm -hmm. and teaching people how to feel that good without this burst and surge of dopamine, uh, as the only source that they get that, uh, that's where that's where the, the true sustainable recovery comes from. Mm. That's so good. And that it goes back to the goals, right? If you don't have a purpose, it's like, for me, I was filling the void with these dopamine hits. There's a great quote from Robert Heinlein. He said, in the absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to performing daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved to it. Daily oh. trivia are those dopamine hits that we're doing all day long. Um, it's so important to find out what's important to you or discover what's important to you and then live on purpose with that purpose. Because I do think it's, it, it was a superpower that I, that I have, I was been called this addictive personality, but there's a lot of like energy in that. I was, putting, I was one of the best video game players in the world. Right. Oh, wow. I was like awesome. that focused on it. And then if I transfer that now to what I'm doing, I want, I want to be one of the best people in our field. Right. So I think it's a superpower that I have. Yeah. And I, I hate that word addictive personality because it means you had passion. Uh -huh. Okay. That passion happened to be for food and video games. Okay. So quit saying the word addictive personality because it comes with these like negative things. Mm. No, it is a, an infusion of the energy where you push it in a direction that does have a long-term reward associated with it. You know, I, I, I had a, a, one of my, my favorite gigs in life was department of defense asked me to help teach um, leaders uh, about how do you heal a brain? So here's 20 years of practice, uh, lots of, you know, bloody noses and black eyes on how to not do it right, but some pretty good rules saying, here's what you got to do if you want to get a brain healthy. And I remember using this analogy over and over again and how helpful that was that in people with addiction, they have found uh, there, there are, in the human brain, there are at least a dozen ways that you can stimulate the production of dopamine. And when you're in development, if you're only practicing one or two of them, uh, that becomes like a number nine wire in the brain that every time you touch it, you're going to make dopamine from that. Every time wow. you touch it, you're going to make dopamine from that. The other th places are turned into like spider threads. 
They're still present in your brain, but you're going to have to exercise them. You're going to have to find a way to say, you mean I can have uh, dopamine pleasure from from sex. I can have dopamine pleasure from exercise. I can have dopamine pleasure from serving other people. And it's, you know, the sex people can jump to, the exercise people talk about, but the serving other people turns into this place where you're like, no, 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 you don't get it. It's a long it's the long game. It's a sustainable process where there's, there's a joy. There's a level of oxytocin, which is this love hormone that really is coupled with an abundant production of dopamine mm. that you can feel in the people who have a purpose that isn't such a burst in valley, like what an exogenous uh, production of, I guess, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's a but, good, that's a good uh, distinction between exogenous dopamine burst versus endogenous. So I, I would also put gratitude right in that practice of endogenous yeah. and oxytocin and a safe way to get dopamine. Uh, how do you, I know there's things like dopamine fasting and resets during the day, but maybe some practical tips for my audience who might be dealing with this. And of course, you know, seek a specialist and that's very important, but what's okay. some practical tips they can do? Maybe some resets where they're not a, on their phone. What can they do? You know, one of my favorite hacks was uh, some things I practiced when I was serving um, uh, an audience of, of inmates. So I would go to this jail and the jail is in a community where 40% of the population is alcohol addicted. Hmm. The average person in front of me had been arrested over 70 times for alcohol addiction. I mean, it's just such a pummeled brains I, 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 to transfer how broken you might think your brain is i'm telling you i would love you to come down do some of the service work and watch to see what does it look like when you're in i mean that's 40 percent of the teachers 40 percent of the preachers wow. have alcoholism 40 percent of the cops 40 percent 40 percent of the community is addicted to alcohol and so you're in this jail and you don't have a lot of resources everybody needs a therapist everybody's had trauma everybody's brain isn't working right so i i I went to say, what is it that I could do that would have transferable resources in a place where, where you're in jail? You don't get to give them drugs. You don't get to give them my prescriptions. How can I help their brains to stop the chaos, which is really where they start to crave and want for their drug, and, and they'll just get obsessed with it. So one of the best um, biohacks for a, a brain that's cheap, easy, and safe is something I call left-handed loops. So I would do this in every one of my um, in every one of my workshops, and I would tell everybody, "Here's the rules," and I'd ha have them pick up a pen or a pencil, and I would um, actually I wonder if I have any in this notebook because when I get pissed off, when I get irritated, <laughs> left-handed <laughs> loops. And so, oh, that's all good. Look at this. So here's a page. <laughs> oh, I see that. So for those listening, it's a whole page of uh, looks like like um, scribble. The letter L. Yeah, if you're writing the letter L, it's the letter L cursive all the way across the page. Ah. And so you, you go all the way across the page, pick up your pen, go all the way, and you're using the non-dominant hand. Mm -hmm. And what you're really looking for is a rhythm of just making that L all the way across the page. Here's the rules. You cannot speak. You cannot make noise from your vocal cords for three minutes. Hmm. And when I give this in a live audience, I, I'm usually talking about brains that are, are healthy and then those that are not. And... Um, unlike uh, you, there are many brains that go through a traumatic age at their you know, peripubertal time, and their emotional development never advances beyond that of a 15-year-old boy. Wow. And frequently, you'll find that these males are now 50 years old in your, in your class, and they're the kind of, they're the guy who uh, gets a girlfriend at you know, 16, 17, 18, and they get married, uh, and at about 28 years old, um, they break up because it's not going well. And then he finds another girl who's maybe 20 years old, but he's 30 years old. And then they date for about 10 years and then they break up again and he finds another one. And then he's now a 50 year old man and he's attracted to a 20 year old girl. Wow. And it really, as much as you make fun, like it's the shape of this 20 year old youthful girl. No, it's her emotional development that he's attracted to. Wow. And so you'll see that there are, when a brain is chronically swollen, when they have chronic inflammatory problems in their, in their brain, their emotional development cannot enhance until you remove that, until you get very little of that. So here's this 50 year old man trying to say, why can't I keep a relationship with someone my own age? And it has everything to do with that emotional development. So I, t I have usually told a story about this and I, I kind of make it funny. And then I say, all right, um, if, you know, if somebody can't hold your quietness 
I, I need you to leave the room ahead of time. And inevitably, especially if there's like 50 people in the room, there's a man who cannot be quiet. He cannot be quiet for the three minutes. I'm pushing his brain with these left-handed loops and he'll crack a joke just to make people laugh because he cannot regulate the science or the silence on his own. His development is blunted. Hmm. And I hate outing them because I'm like, oh, I feel really bad because everybody now knows you're stuck. And the reason you continue to drink booze every weekend is because you can't find this joy outside of that moment. Wow. And I, I just think uh, looking at some of the hacks, uh, so I tell your audience this thing, all right, you're alone, you're gonna be quiet, three minutes. And then what happens when you do a left-handed loop over and over and over again is, oh, it's remarkable to watch a room do this. Uh, their breathing rate slows down. Uh, I'll ask people when they get done with the three minutes, what did, what did you feel? And some people are like, oh, I felt relaxed. Oh, I felt like my, I, I finally settled down. And other people say, I felt anxious. Mm. Feel the tension, like they couldn't let go of it. And essentially it is a, you know, it's a very uh, primitive way to do meditation. Uh, you're getting that right brain and that left brain. And then there's a, there's a part of it that's rhythmic, that's part of your cerebellum. And so when you look at functional MRIs as they do non-dominant loops across their, their paper, by the end of the three minutes, there is this, uh the, there's this synchronization of those three parts of the brain which is highly uh connected to what happens during meditation that is cool yeah it's a fun trick and you can do it in jail <laughs> yeah yeah you can do it anywhere on an airplane would that work for somebody who's um experiencing anxiety have you seen it help with that yeah yeah it's a it's a beautiful way to say especially when you can feel the emotions starting to take over they're, mm -hmm. they're starting to like so i when I'm working with you know keto people, I think, okay, when you're craving, what you're really telling me is you don't have the skills to navigate through this moment. You're wanting a food. Your brain is saying, rah, I deserve it. I need it. I want it. And it, your brain is winning. So I need you to hack. I need you to, I need to, I need you to cross the wires suddenly in your brain. And if you give them something too internal to do, like, you know, sing the alphabet backwards or something like a puzzle mentally you can get some people to engage but i found especially those people who are stuck with that adolescent trauma really haunting them for years later left-handed loops is this beginning step that just melts that if they can really focus on the moment of just watch that pen watch that paper watch what happens give it three minutes give me three minutes give me three minutes and to offer that in a time when the cravings are just like I can be on the keto diet for, you know, six weeks. And then I just, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. And what they're saying is that's about the time people white knuckle their addiction mm. is six weeks. And so they've put in these new little hacks, but their brain says, forget it. I I want what we want. And, and now they're, now they're fighting a wiring problem in their brain. So that is super, that's a super interesting um, explanation. I've never heard of that before. Left-handed loops. Give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot too. I mean, it's probably makes sense for us to just do it like in general to get kind of a dopamine oh. reset, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to give that a shot. So I didn't expect the conversation to start with brain health, but I love that you did. <laughs> um, I know alcohol is a neurotoxin. You know, of course, drugs are, are toxic to the brain and we have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and all these brain -ish disorders that are skyrocketing, as you know. Mm. What what about glucose? I mean, what is glucose doing? These hits of glucose and insulin throughout the day, the 88% of Americans who are metabolically unhealthy, what is that doing to the brain and the body? Oh, right. That's just a beautiful segue into that where um, when I look at how powerful our poor health has come, has become uh, front and center for any primary care physician, that the chronic illnesses that acquire throughout that age of, you know, you can say teenagers, but let's just, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say 22 to 52. For those 30 years, this slow, insidious accumulation of aging, of shutting down this human, of really working backwards in against their health at a cellular level. And I contend there is no greater enemy than the, the slippery little dictator called insulin. <laughs> Uh, which is, of course, uh, dictating to get that glucose uh, out of the bloodstream and into 
uh, into a storage place, whether that's a fat cell, a liver cell, a muscle cell, or anybody, any cell that needs a little energy. So let me, let me do a little game with you. So, um, if you look at um, one of the highest uh, publicly funded educations for middle schoolers, uh, it comes from the, the industry of concussions. So have you ever had a concussion? No. No? Do you know, do you know, about, you know anybody that's had a concussion? Yes. Okay. So tell me what happened to them. What was, what was their brain doing? Car accident. Um concussion what happened to that person specifically afterwards yeah so tell me about their brain like do you remember anything that was going on with their brain like yeah oh, you know, repeating the same words um brain fog some short-term memory issues were the most common symptoms that i recognized yeah mm -hmm. did they did he have a headache i don't remember um but i would say probably yeah most likely they had a headache yeah um, and when you when you think about um, the acquisition of these symptoms that come with concussion, you know, headache is very common. Repetition of words is common. Uh, confusion is common. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll find um, that their coordination can be off. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Do you think people can die from a concussion? Yes. Okay. So how do they die? Trauma to the brain. Um, impact to the brain. Um, severe inflammation uh right so that that trauma comes into the brain and that energy swells the brain and that swelling of the brain only has one door if the skull yeah and so it'll push it down the brain stem unless you go to the surgeon and they take a big door out of their skull and honest to god we lay it right next to their bed until that swelling has gone down then we put it back in and we sew it back on it's wild Okay, so that's what happens when a concussion in a, a very short sequence of how swollen is their brain. So uh, I'm going to use one example and then we're going to get to glucose. When you look at alcohol, um, describe some symptoms that happen in the function of a brain mm -hmm. when you've used alcohol. Yeah, everything we just shared, <laughs> repeating yes. your words, confusion. confusion. <laughs> Can't navigate very well. Uh, Headache from a hangover too. Yep. Hangover. Okay. So can you die from too much alcohol? Yeah, absolutely. You even share with me that people die in your uh, South Dakota from freezing to death. <laughs> uh, although, yeah. Right. How do they die from alcohol? Uh, of poisoning. Short, uh, yeah. So what's alcohol poisoning? How does that work? Liver toxicity. Liver can't, the body can't detoxify uh, quick enough. Um, it's too much poison. Right. So that the uh, liver disease is long term alcohol, short term alcohol, ah. you know, four shots of alcohol. It, it goes into the brain the and brain. causes swelling. It, sw it pulls water with it for one alcohol, one molecule of alcohol. It pours four molecules of water. And so now you have this infusion of, of inflammation of water into the brain. And there's only one hole to push that brain into, which is down the spinal cord. And unlike an ICU where I can calculate just how swollen is your brain uh, before I call the surgeon and put that doorway into your top of your skull, you're on a frat house with nobody paying attention. Your breathing mm. slowly suppresses and you suffocate. Wow. And that, that whole story is worthy of telling because why do you think insulin works so stinking hard to get sugar out of the bloodstream? It's a toxin. It's a toxin. What happens when you're a diabetic and your sugar goes super high? How do they die? Well, they, they die from a lot of complications, but it, it ends up in like their eyes. It ends up in their heart, it ends up in their brain. Um, right. That, and again, that's long-term. Oh, long-term. But if you're a type one diabetic and you go into a diabetic coma because your blood sugar shoots to 800, mm. how do they die? Diabetic coma, like too much sugar in the brain. Yep. Yes. So that sugar, that glucose also pulls water molecules with it and your body will, it will secrete so much insulin to keep that glucose from killing you. Mm. That high glucose will swell your brain and it will push that brain down the hole in the spinal cord. And by golly, they die. They suffocate and they die. That's what a diabetic coma is. And when, when you look at that chronic diseases that come along from smoldering of, uh, uh, of uh, chronic brain injury, like, I don't know, boxing or <laughs> football playing. Yeah. Uh, and then players, you, yep. right. Or you look at the chronic brain disease that happens from uh, 
alcoholism over time. Their brains are not pretty after about 10 years of drinking. They're really not pretty. A very similar brain anatomy shows up with this chronically elevated blood sugars in mm. people's systems. Unfortunately, it's this, just like alcoholism, it's the slow, steady acquisition of a behavior the people, eh, everybody does it. I, I'm not a, I'm not too much heavier than the guy next to me. My blood sugar isn't that high. I checked it the other day. It was a little high, but what they're what they're missing is the that insidious, slimy dictator of insulin is now five times higher than it should be. They put in a little bit of food, and instead of a, a tablespoon of of insulin, they produce a cup of insulin. Mm. And that is uh, that process of having chronically elevated blood sugars and chronic production of insulin is what creates that uh, pathology that's super sneaky and tiny, but absolutely what makes us um, elders before we should, increases our risk of cancer, uh, increases the uh, autoimmune disorders, uh, especially those diseases of memory problems and uh, and of course, heart disease. And so you look at, you know, one of my campaigns for the last year has been, um, how do you get the doctor out of the way? <laughs> I mean, as much as you're like, oh, I'd like to pay off all those medical lo loans too. Uh, no, I, I want the patients that come to see me to not have to need me so much. Yeah. And, you know, sinking uh, a a, an education of how do I connect with them that what they're doing to their brains by having an average blood sugar north of 120 is cutting off a memory cycle that you you have you don't know what um, I mean you can go to any nursing home and see what that's what you're missing it isn't that they're in a nursing home for a week they're in nursing homes for a couple of decades now you know it is because the brain doesn't work mm -hmm. that brain accumulated a whole bunch of proteins that shouldn't have been put in your there and they were absolutely linked to what is your average blood sugar mm -hmm. and i contend you shouldn't be asking me what your average blood sugar is you should care about it and you should be able to test it in your own home yeah and yeah that's uh that's been one of i think the advent of uh medicine in the 21st century is how do you how do you let the physician go back to what their core role was supposed to be which is teacher educator, uh, not prescriber. <laughs> You're so right. That's what a physician means, teacher, teacher, educator, to your point. And unfortunately, a cured patient is a lost customer for a lot of these doctors. And that's just the way it's set up, right? And you know, you've seen that firsthand. And we have, though, it's not just the doctors that we're kind of battling. It's it's like the fitness industry, too. They're, they're going to you know tell their clients, a lot of health coaches and dietitians as well, it's okay to eat every two to three hours. It's okay as long as you're active. And that's not the case for mo most American adults. I mean, you know, the study 88% from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill showed 88% of our of Americans are unhealthy. They're eating mm -hmm. frequently. They have high glucose levels, high insulin levels. I remember when I interviewed a colleague of mine, Dr. Don Klum, he did a patient population survey to, uh, he had hundreds of his patients write down every time they ate something. So it could have been a snack or a full meal, but anytime they started that glucose insulin process, and the average person was doing it 17 to 23 times per day, right? And if, you, if you think about it, you know that that could be true because it's like the handful of almonds. It's the kombucha. But to your point, what I've learned from you, it's also like the chewing gum and the mints. Oh, the yes. Could you talk about that too? Yeah. You know, it's it's such a sneaky thing that happens when when you finally get behind the the, the doors of watching patient data over time. Uh, you get them wearing continuous glucose monitors and I don't know if I if the first time I learned it was my patients who were wearing a continuous glucose monitor, but it became absolutely I had every single person test this theory uh, after I learned what the first few taught me, and that is you 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 know and you can find this this isn't just in my practice, but I I didn't know this until the patients showed me that when they would chew on a a breath mint when they would chew gum, the amount of insulin that would be produced by their system especially in somebody who's not healthy was it was abundant and it was coming from the mastication the chewing cycle that was with their gum so if, if you look at the continuum that i put patients on to say how do you go from here to there because if you sprint you're gonna fall it's these steady steps that do really need to be tackled and unpacked why do you have uh you know, you know why is it that you're chewing gum for every hour of the day 
and, and you'll, so I have these gum chewers. This is the, the, how I learned this. And they would be able to eat what they needed to in this five hour window. And then their sugars would go up and they would feel terrible. And you could just see the spikes in some of their sugars. Like, what are you doing about every hour? And they would say, oh, I'm putting in another piece of gum. Mm. And so then I'm like, all right, you get nothing over the next day but gum. And oh my goodness, their sugars did not go down at all. Wow. You're like, okay, you are making so much insulin and, and they are stimulating, but they feel terrible too because the insulin's trying to push down the sugar. The sugars, you know, they have unfortunately plenty of sugar to keep them from doing anything disastrous, but they sure as heck were not going to lose weight until we said, okay, you're masticating as a coping skill. When I tell you to stop eating, you're you're chewing as a as a way to deal with some sort of stress. And I need you to chew only in the only in those five hours. If you want to chew gum, you can have all the gum you want in those five hours that you eat. But outside of that, I need the 19 other hours to clean up this mess you've made over the last 30 years. And of course, this would reveal, I mean, that's where the stress would come from. They'd fall off the wagon. I can't do it. Well, you're taking away gum. How dare you? I'm like, it's it's not me. Your system shows me very clearly that when you masticate, and then again, I didn't, if I was taught this in medical school, I completely forgot it because then I'm going back to the physiology books. Do they really make that much, you know, can it stimulate the production of insulin? Oh, by golly, it's right in the textbooks. <laughs> the amylase secretion from your parotid gland is part of the mastication and it does uh, correlate to the production of insulin. And when they're insulin resistant, when they had that, you know, brain toxicity where that dictator of insulin is sliming over everything, when they chew gum, they make as much insulin as somebody who you know, 150 years ago, I mean, they would make it eating a birthday cake or eating something that's a pastry. Wow. And so they're, just the excessive production of insulin is so linked to their eating behavior that uh, the two biggest mistakes I see people make on when they're trying to limit their eating window and they're really trying to work themselves through a process that gets healthier is they chew as a coping skill uh, and they the particle size of their foods is something they've been ignoring. So they'll say, I eat this processed, you know, pulverized <laughs> protein and pulverized fat, and it's in these tiny little particle sizes. And unfortunately, every one of those particle sizes equates to a food morsel in that first section of their duodenum, their first section of their gut lining. So it's signaling, make a bunch of insulin because all these particles are stimulating this, uh, this sensation that she must have eaten a lot. There's a ton of particle sizes. Uh, uh, a ton of particles in the food, as opposed to had you eaten whole foods of that fat and you chewed it, there's no way that you could have, you know, put that particle size that into that. Fast. Yeah, that fast or that tiny. There's you're, you're, you're chewing and you're, the acid in your stomach and the grinding in your stomach would have never shrunk that particle size that tiny and made that many particle sizes out of a, you know, a sardine or something. Uh, they take this powdered something, something, and they say, I'm, I'm keto and I'm doing it right. And I'm like, how are you doing it? And so you're, you're, you're referring, of course, to protein shakes, just, just to be clear for my audience who's not aware. So whey protein shakes, collagen, they're probably putting collagen in their coffee. Um, yeah. You're saying that this is very unnatural because it's in these small particles that would take a lot more time to get into, but it's already that small. And mm -hmm. then you get this surge of insulin. Insulin. Yep. Absolutely. This, this is why there's a lot of studies that show whey insulin is highly insulinogenic and what that's doing. Now, exactly. let me ask you this. Are you opposed to protein shakes all the time or is there a time and place to sprinkle it in for some people? Right. So convenience in the 21st century is this blend of how do we get um, them to do, to do behaviors that are better. Um, when I'm looking at patients that I put on um, pulverized protein, uh, so I, they're usually very sick. Um, so I, I, I can't find a way to get the nourishment in them any higher. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, Ben, it's not very often anymore. Um, when, when you, again, uh, these poor physicians that after this recent course want to, you know, give up their life of, you know, surgery and high, highly billable. <laughs> I'm like, you cannot bill for educating people on keto. It doesn't work. <laughs> Medicare does not pay you. Uh, but you look at, um, you know, a couple of things that you learn by watching. I mean, I watched 200 students do a couple of things that 
Uh, I'm actually going to talk about it on my live tonight, which because it, it, it's so fascinating to me that I've seen it one on one with my patients, but to have 200 of them do it at once, it, it, it blows your mind to say, okay, I think this needs to be a new rule in my world. And that is um, when you look at uh, what happens with an insulin resistant patient who in part of the uh, part of the program, they had to, they had three days where the only food that they could eat from noon on Sunday to noon on Wednesday was sardines. If you Yum. want liquids, yeah, <laughs> right? that's not what most of them said. They're like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm being sarcastic. I'm not, not yeah, I'm really good for you, but definitely I don't like the taste. <laughs> right. So said everybody in there. But what happened was this, I mean, there was most of the people were insulin resistant. Most of the people, I could see their insulin resistance in their daily glucoses and daily poor ketone production for the week prior to this. And then without exception, they took in this highly absorbable protein and fat. And, and by the way, the most absorbable calcium is in sardines, a very nutrient dense food. And first of all, nobody overdosed on sardines. Yeah. I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was their blood sugars, everybody's blood sugar lowered. Mm. I have insulin resistant patients who fast for 72 hours and they can't lower their blood sugars because, wow. because of what's happening on the backside. Um, so when I say, well, I let people do pulverized protein, if they're fit and, and it's a convenience and they're not insulin resistant, absolutely. If they put it in their four hour window and there was, there was just nothing else they could eat. Okay, fine. But if they're actually trying to reverse insulin resistance, you're, you're fighting me that those tiny particle sizes, just, they just ping the heck out of the stimulus to your pancreas to bathe everything in your dictator again. And that's the opposite direction we want to be going. We want to go this direction. And there are cheap, easy, convenient foods that come in a can that I'm pretty sure you're going to find one in, I know there's one in the glove box of all of my cars. <laughs> uh, and that's sardines. I mean, so it is not sexy. The, the, the chances they're going to get addicted to the dopamine surge associated. Yeah, very with unlikely. The, yeah. Well, we've heard and, we've heard of the bacon, butter, beef, and eggs fast. We should do one with sardines now. Thirty days straight of sardines challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a patient that did this. You're going to be careful because. Oh really? Wow. Oh my gosh! You should see his numbers. That he, is commitment. He, he, he yeah. Honestly, uh, what I had people do was uh, the first the first time we did the challenge, they got sardines, and again, there were some people who who really took their food volume down. <laughs> I mean, one or two cans a day. Um, and then the second the second week, we did a, a water fast and said, if you've never, you have people that had never done that before. Mm -hmm. and said, if you've never done that, everybody can get to 36 hours. Everybody can get to a 36 hour fast. And if after the 36 hours you want to eat in this 72 hours, you can finish out the fast with sardines. Sardines. Yeah, interesting. And the metabolics that what happened behind the scenes to their metabolism was just impressive. Like that is worth playing with. If you're stuck, that's worth playing with. Yeah. I like that. So let me back to the protein stuff. Mm -hmm. I know there's different companies that formulate protein shakes differently. Like some will include like whole egg powder and different things. So will there be ones that are worse, more insulinogenic versus those that are better? And then what if you consume them around a workout when you're more insulin sensitive? So the stuff I've read for the um, insulin, um, the, the uh, around a workout, that branch chain amino acid that gets uh, associated with um, near a workout, it definitely has the ability to stimulate that muscle growth. Um, I would contend though, if that's what you're doing is taking in a muscle or a protein to build the muscle in your body to really strengthen, then you shouldn't be insulin resistant. Okay. Insulin resistance is a season, uh, after you've lost the weight. And I think that's another major thing that's happened in my practice is, oh gosh, do you know how many hours I've spent telling people how, how they should exercise and go for a little walk and get their heart rate up? I do not say that anymore. I never tell them to do that. And it's not that I don't think they should exercise. I think that you do not fix insulin resistance with exercise. Mm. You fix insulin resistance with the way you eat. Mm. And there is so much that can be done with improving how they eat. And the best part is once they're feeling good, humans like to go for walks. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. like to be active and they will do it without me telling them once they feel better. 
and I don't have to say, did you get 185 steps in, you know, whatever, 10,000 steps in this and the, no, you don't have to be that methodical. And over in past chapters of human behavior, have we needed that? It, you know, looking at people who come to me saying, am I getting too much protein? Uh, I, I want to do this protein shake. And I have teenagers that are, you know, trying to be muscular and all the kinds of things boys want to do at 16 to 22. And they can have protein shakes. Uh, they can have creatine in their drink. They can have branched chain amino acids. They're not insulin resistant. They haven't spent the last 20 years with a big fat tummy. Yeah, uh, fair point, fair point. Mm -hmm. And most and people so, are insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. But here's, so, uh, here's the thing, Dr. Boz, A1C, right? You're big on the A1C, which I think, and I want you to get into why and some of the reasons why the A1C might not be accurate, but wouldn't it take typically five to maybe 15 years before that A1C changes, but the insulin is going up and up and up uh, during that time frame. Sure. But I would contend it doesn't, if you look at the normal range for A1C, so let's go back. Uh, A1C has a correlation to average blood sugar mm -hmm. and how we're looking at that average blood sugar is we're using the lifespan of a red blood cell. Yeah. So in people who have a red blood cell that um, is, um, typically, uh, the span isn't as long. Uh, you'll see that they, the average changes, uh, like you'll, you'll read an A1C that's much higher because you're only studying a shorter period of their, of the red blood cells life. So what, what scenario could you like, what scenario would that be? So alcoholism is okay. a place where red blood cells would um, be less. Beta, beta thalassemia is a genetic disorder where the the, la the length of lifespan of the red blood cell is shorter. So you're going to see that the average blood sugars are are not estimated correctly, but they will have a stable for them. Got it. Uh, so let, let, but let's just take the the rest of the world who isn't have they have normal red blood cells like but before you before you do the beta th of um the genetic disorder and the alcoholism would you see a lower reading or a higher reading a false high or false low i actually want to make sure i i say this correctly so we might want to google this i i'm pretty sure that the lifespan of the of the blood cell is shortened therefore the a1c that's read out uh I think it's higher. I, I have it in my head that it's higher, but I, I'm not... I have it in my head that it's lower for some reason. It's yeah. lower, so we should definitely look it up because I, it's been. Can uh, you look it up or no? I, I can look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's find out. We could do this live on the episode right now. Let me see if I can look it up too. Uh, Google is still very good. If I could find this, um, okay. There's a study here. Pit Markedly low hemoglobin A1C. You're right. Uh, it, it is lower. You're right. It would it is be lower. lower. Okay, got it. Yeah. So okay. because the, the short the, the lifespan is shorter. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So, like, so that so there you, that's really important because if you know somebody who's like, oh, my A1C is fine. It's you know 4.9 or 5.1, but you know they're drinking alcohol all the time. They eat very unhealthy. That could be one of the reasons why. So, but that's pretty rare. That's not common. So, what are the most common things we see with A1C? Yeah. So the average of A1C, what I want my A1C to be is closer to 4.5, 4.6. 4.0. I don't know if mine has ever been that low. <laughs> well, I have I have some patients who have really been working on their A1Cs. They started out at seven or eight and their doctor says it's below six. You're fine. I'm like, oh, but, that's, gosh. but that's still associated with an increased tau proteins in your brain and dementia. So getting it below five is where I would push patients to go. Now, having said that, moving my whole family at the age of 50 across the country, uh, plus, um, you know, a little, you know, life being a little upside down for the last year, I checked mine if, probably three years ago and it was 4.9 or 4.8 or something. And then this past like summer when I was actually, when I was at KetoCon, it came back at like 5.5 .5 or 5.6. And I was horrified. I was so mad. I'm like, oh, this is what happens when you don't look. <laughs> so, <laughs> so have you tested since? Oh, I've got a contest going. Like there are three people on my team that all said, oh, it's totally higher than I want it to be. And one <laughs> of them is a young woman. She's only like 30 and she's she's lost 40 pounds. She's, you know, in these cute little skinny jeans. She has nothing that should be uh, inhibiting her except her hemoglobin A1C is in, you know, like 5.5. .5. So we said every month we're going to check our A1C because even though the red blood cell lasts for three months, 
you should be able to see a trend downward at the end of every month. Mm -hmm. And because this is something you can do on your own, it's $40. You don't need to argue with your doctor. You don't need to say, but I don't have diabetes. All the things that will get in the way of ordering this routinely. No, um, we had a contest within our family and my son who thought for sure he was going to have the best A1C had the worst. Wow. He, he, he sneaks sugar. <laughs> what was his A1C? Uh, it wasn't terrible. I think it was like 5.1. Okay. So not terrible, but the other boys are all at 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. Uh, so they had high muscle mass and they are young and healthy and they don't have high blood sugars. So that is possible. <laughs> First of all, people think, oh, you must be like starving if you have no, if you have low blood sugars. No, you're just not rescuing with dopamine created mm -hmm. by sugar. Yeah. Plus we so, got ketones for the win too. Amen. Yes, exactly. Well, you, you texted me before the interview and you're like, when did you last time you tested your A1C? I'm like, oh, like a year and a half ago, it was 5.1. So now I want to get in the four. So I'm curious. I'm going to do one soon to see where it's at. Well, I should just send them to you. I'll send you. I yeah, please. One. There you go. Yeah. How does that work? Share how that works, right? There you go. A1C, yeah. Dr. Boz test. Yeah. So again, this is my friend uh, who I did not know did this. And I was so happy to hear a point of care, a point of care. And you prick your finger and you put your the blood drip on a sponge you spend send the the envelope back to his lab and they look at how many of those hemoglobin are glycated meaning how many are splat with sugar instead of open for the oxygen molecule to hang out on it which would then be delivering oxygen to your cells so when people think yeah why is it that a1c is such a big deal to people it's because what you're compromising is you're trading that's supposed to be a cube of sugar. That's You're trading good. sugar for oxygen. Not good. And that is not good. A recipe for and disaster. I, I have said, you know, many times, get the doctor out of the way, let the patient check their numbers, and then reach for a goal. I would actually encourage people to do this with a buddy. Like there's several people that I've said, you don't need to pay me to do a support group. Just do a darn support group and meet once a week and talk about where you're at with your eating. And you can't believe what happens when you just consistently stay on target for improving a behavior, forgiving yourself when you fall off, improving a behavior. And I said, do a contest, do a hemoglobin A1C in your little group and have everybody check one. And then so if it's check. above 5.5, <laughs> you're like me, uh, I, within... Within 30 days, I got mine down to 5.3, and uh, now I'm hoping I get it down to 5.1 because I've that's great. Really I've, done. <laughs> that's awesome. No, I love the idea of a hemoglobin hemoglobin A1C contest, even with like my academy students. So I might do something like that with them, but with your family, even better. You know, yeah. especially if you know somebody who's competitive, it's like that's the best way to inspire them. <laughs> that was the best part about this kid that my son who is was so sure he put a hundred dollars that he was going to have the best one. And he was the worst. Oh, wow. <laughs> like that Walker. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. I love that you made it uh, accessible. Where can they get those kits by the way? All right. Bo BozMD.com. Uh, they're, they're for sale and quite, quite, um, quite an asset actually. It was not available before March 1st. It just came on the market. I think I was the first one to partner with Omega Quant who's um, co-branded essentially uh, with it because they designed it. They've got the technology. They've got through FDA approval. I just um, said, I will help make sure the world knows about this because it's a great, it's a great little tool. It sure is. And you were at KetoCon doing A1Cs. Were you able to give them the results at KetoCon or did? They had, we have to take those little uh, blood spots and send them to the lab for the analysis. So they and got them they all. Get it. Like how, mm -hmm. how soon after you send it in, do you get it? Yeah. When we sent it, like, what was it? 500 of them there <laughs> we got them they got them back in like three days but they did all of ours within a day when they got them so usually once you mail it in you get the results in about a week okay yeah this is important we, uh, get into like a little bit more about the the glycation process right the advanced yeah. glycation end products and what it, what these sugars do to attach to proteins and how it's damaging our our oh. cellular health it truly is that word glycation is uh is a verb it is where sugar sticks to things that shouldn't have that shouldn't be sticky. And of course, when it sticks to the hemoglobin, that's where your oxygen was supposed to be to carry and deliver it to your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your skin, your nose, all of those cells needed oxygen. And when you look at the number of seats that you can carry, yes, when you're anemic, you don't have as many seats, but that isn't nearly as powerful as what happens when you take out, you know, one fifth of your, um, 
of your cells. So 5% uh, you know, of, of your cells being splat with sugar, that's a hemoglobin A1C of five. Mm. Because the A1C is actually a percentage. It's the percentage of seats that are splat with sugar and cannot carry oxygen anymore. And there will always be some, we are always going to have some glucose that, that does that, but it should be in that four and a half percent. You shouldn't have these spiking sugars, uh, especially chasing the dopamine with our beautiful, you know, culinary lives of 2022. Uh, it really does send sugars up and it stays for a long period of time, much longer than it should. should. And every what, time you the, spike it. What's the lowest you've seen A1C? You know, uh, I think that now that we say this out loud, I should have thought of that patient to begin with. It was one of my beta thalassemia patients where it was like a five, a 4.3. Oh, wow. But that was a genetic thing. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit different. But outside of that, what's the lowest yeah. we've seen? In that 404, 405 range, um, that's, that, I mean, I think it's really hard to get it any lower than that. But when, when you look at folks who truly stay out of the cycle of rescuing with a, a sweet tooth, uh, it's not it's not uncommon to see them really get that out of the fives or out of the sixes and into the mid fives. And then, especially if they can stay away from alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, oh my God. Like I gave up alcohol almost eight years ago. I haven't had a sip and not because I was ever addicted to it, but I just took me off my mission and the mission was more important than a temporary buzz. So now that you've explained even more about the dangers of alcohol, I'm like, I'm so glad I gave it up. And hopefully this inspires people to at least <laughs> limit your alcohol intake. I mean, it's just not good for you. Um, so it's a concussion you. every time you have a buzz. And yeah. Great. I love how you <laughs> broke that down. The concussion and the sugar and the alcohol. It's like brain swelling. Think about that. Every time you take a sip, even if it's the best alcohol in the world, brain is swelling. Alcohol is a toxin. Amen. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, you know, that it, it really is something I've been passionate about too, is to, to look at, I have three sons that are in this uh, world of how do you, how do you get kids that aren't entitled? How do you inspire people to be brave in today's world without getting their, you know, getting them knocked down and never to try again. And, you know, the world of having access to sugar is one thing, but having access to marijuana and alcohol and other mm -hmm. brain altering drugs that uh, the development in today's world, once they sink into a place where their brain's not doing well, I mean, we don't have, there's not all stories are beautiful like yours, where he found the way to turn it around. He found the way to put the passion in it. And I really just commend you for being in the space to show other men what it looks like to say, I've had a tough chapter and here's how I got on the on a better path. Because that inspiration to to lead, to be the Pied Piper of how do you how do you raise strong men, boys into men? And as a mother of three sons, it is something I, I think about, I pray about, I volunteer in places to say it might not be my own son that I'm helping, but that development of giving them the power of a healthy life, uh, it's a lot harder in 2022 because mm. temptations are close right around the corner from sugar to yeah. alcohol. Social to media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, by the way. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to close the conversation with one final topic. Um, so you mentioned how, you know, glycation is really bad and Part of that picture is what it's what sugar is doing to the mitochondria and all the, the reactive oxygen species that are produced. It's like a one firefighter having to keep up with a whole building on fire. It can't keep up with it. And eventually that fire is going to take over similar when you're a sugar burner and you're not in ketosis. So what are the benefits of getting yourself into ketosis and how does that relate to this mitochondrial uncoupling process that you love to speak about? Mm, I love to talk about this. Yeah. So yeah, the uncoupled mitochondria is the goal for reversing some of these problems. And one of, one of the places that I've used recently to try and explain this to people is when, when you look at a mitochondria that's coupled, think of it as uh, it is linked to calories in to calories out. The amount of fuel that you're going to get comes from how much fuel are they swallowing and that's how much fuel we can produce. That is what a coupled mitochondria looks like. And the body is always trying to get back to that. That is an energy conservative place. That's how, that's the goal. That's the homeostasis it's looking for. The only way that you can hack and be in a different journey of higher energy and uncoupled mitochondria is the fuel inside that mitochondria must be different. And when we uncouple the mitochondria, it is essentially a time when 
uh, our, our ancestors, our ancient ancestors would say, hey, guess what? There is no food around. We're going to have to survive without an intake of calories. And those bodies which could uncouple the association of energy production is no longer linked to what you're eating. It is producing energy in a faulty way, in a dangerous way. It's wasteful and it's just producing energy. And if you don't use it, if you make that ketone out of that uncoupled mitochondria uh, and you don't burn it in another place in your body, you pee it out. So you're going to run out of energy someday, but thankfully we're all built with a little bit of pinch an inch around most of the corners. So that, that, that fat fuel was going to last most of the people, you know, the people who survived, uh, they took that uncoupling and they wasted energy. It went out of that mitochondria. It went out of that mitochondria. And then the better part of what was happening at a cellular level is once that mitochondria is uncoupled and it's burning ketones, it's, um, you know, those liver is making a bunch of ketones. You now have, if you're measuring, you'd have 3.0 ketones or 4.0 ketones. Uh, they are sponging up those uh, free radicals. They are reversing what cellular damage should be happening. They are not glycating things. It is a cleaner fuel that your body will only go in the lane of wastefulness uh, when it's an uncoupled process. And so when, when patients ask, Do I, should I be in ketosis for the rest of my life? I'm like, well, you have to keep practicing how to get there. Your body is always going to want to go back to that coupled version where glucose comes in and that's what we burn. We are coupled to what she's eating. If you don't stress that metabolism, and whether that's through you know, fasting or exercise or sauna or whatever way that you burn more calories than you have available coming in your mouth, that's how you uncouple a mitochondria. And to continue to practice, to flex that fuel, to turn on that mitochondrial wasting energy, that uncoupled energy, that's where the, the zone of uh, reversing inflammation, keeping the... Um, the free radicals very low in the, in the cellular level, not, not like swallowing a bunch of antioxidants. No, I'm talking from the inside out, you mop those up and you get this joy of a, a much better source field for uh, energy that, that really can last you without eating. Mm. And that, that isn't common in today's world to talk about like the, the, the life of depriving you from food really is how you push that metabolism to to enhance and um and you can look at a lot of waistlines and see there's plenty of room for us to waste some energy uncouple so, the mitochondria totally most people need to waste more energy please um okay brilliant explanation i just love that i, I want to unpack it in case it went over somebody's head um wasting energy let's unpack that real quick so during times of scarcity, all of our ancestors went during times of famine. Um, keto is a metabolic process. It's not a fad diet. It's been around forever. So when our ancestors didn't have food, they burned through their sugar reserves, aka their glycogen stores, aka their liver and muscle cells. Now what's the next option? There's no food. So what does it do? Okay, we start mobilizing body fat. Fatty acids are sent to the liver. Ketones are produced. Now, this is the time where we start wasting energy, right? When the cells are now, the mitochondria are, are signaling with the ketones and there's an increase in heat, increase in energy, which increases your metabolic rate, which mm -hmm. helps you burn fat. But let me ask you this. I know the reason why this is happening is because we're burning fat, but the term wasting energy sounds like a bad thing. Could you just explain that real quick? Yeah, your body's saying, don't do it, don't do it. The wasting of energy means as that uh, liver mitochondria makes ketones, takes fat and makes ketones, uh, there's only two places that you can send that ketone. You cannot wind the ketone back up for storage. Once it's in ketone form, you either burn it, and if it circulates for a couple of hours, you pee it out. So or you breath wait. too, right? Acetone. Or breath, yep. yep. Another place to get rid of it. So if so, it's giving that human the opportunity that if they want to run after the saber tooth tiger and get their meal, they have the energy to do that. But if the opportunity isn't there, it's worth it's worth wasting it because if every day that they went without food, they got weaker and slower, mm. and the energy was less, yeah. they die. They, they, that might have happened in a you know branch of the human race but yeah. they didn't live the ones who could get through that time and have the energy to chase after the meal that's who won thank god for metabolic flexibility and ketosis the reason we exist today all you keto bashers you wouldn't live today if it wasn't for keto 
dang um, straight. I, and then to, to be clear, I think we agree here because my my messaging with keto is a little bit different than a lot of people out there. It's similar to Dr. Mindy Powell. So I know you had a conversation oh, yeah, with, yeah. in my book, Keto Flex behind me. I think keto is great, but I don't think we should be in keto for the rest of our life. I think we should flex in and out. Is that what I heard you say as well? Right. I tell patients don't need to try to do that though. Um, so that's one of the places in this last course that I, that I took patients and said, what, what are their ketones during, during the day? What are they doing during the night? And how mm. often are they switching between glucose and ketones? And when I hear patients that are insulin resistant say, but I got to have a carb day. I'm like, you don't understand. It's going to take you four days to get back to a metabolic state where you can flip it over again. When people look like you, Ben, they're lean. They've got mostly yeah. muscle definition. They can have, their body's going to flip back and forth between ketones and glucose. And you're going to use glucose without storing it in a layer of pinch an inch all the way around every corner. That, that, that pudginess comes from, from storing and being in a coupled uh, uh, energy cycle for extended period of time where you can build up that storage. When they're lean, your body is going to do it naturally. And my, every one of my insulin resistant patients that hops onto a keto journey and they lose all this weight and then they flatline. I'm stalled. I'm stalled. I'm like, yeah, because that's what your body did. It is back to coupling the food. What you eat is what you're burning. And in order to get back to a weight loss process, to undo these 30 years of that slimy little dictator doing its naughty, you have to uncouple the energy again, it's great. which means you got to flex, you got to push it. You got to take that extended window and say, four hours is all you can eat. And now the new rule is that four hours needs to be during daylight. Mm -hmm. You cannot eat after the sun sets. And then we have other rules. Yeah. I, I love that. And and like you said, it's, it's, there's many ways to uncouple. There is exercise, there is heat stress, cold stress. There is, um, taking, um, MCTs like goat dairy and sheep dairy. I, I know you're big fans of those because they have, uh, 30% mm -hmm. of his MCTs uncoupling. And there's also like a certain antioxidants. And um, sardines. Oh, sardines. They're going back to the sardines. You know, I know of all the amazing benefits of sardines, but it's so hard for me to eat it. <laughs> my fiance loves them, but me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta like just suck it up. All right, um, I, I just push you. The next time you lead, you lead students all the time, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm calling you to do like a 48 hour challenge. Everybody <laughs> only eat sardines, and then watch what their ketones do by the end of 48 That's true. hours. I'm very competitive, so that'll get me to do it too. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. So we're on the same page. I agree with you. If somebody's insulin resistant, type 2 diabetic, you, you need more uncoupling, more long, more ketosis versus somebody who's... The goal is to become metabolically flexible so you could go yeah, in and out, have mm -hmm. a higher carb, healthy carb meal, and go right back into ketosis the next day like myself. That's the ultimate goal. But uncoupling is the name of the game. Last thing I want to ask you is this. Morning glucose numbers that are typically high day in, day out. What, what are you seeing there? Is there a dawn effect or is there something else going on there? What's going on with morning glucose? Yeah, I, everybody has. So the dawn effect is this overly broadcasted, it sounds like pathology, but it, it is what you do every morning too. As, as the globe turns and that sun True. is coming up, your pineal gland says, hey, wake Ben up with a little surge of glucose. Mm -hmm. And that message goes to your liver and you release and your glucose goes up. But unlike my insulin resistant patients, your glucose goes back down. Mm -hmm. So it woke you up and you started your day and your glucose was back to normal. When I look at morning fasting glucoses that are elevated, it's a glucose that goes up and they have so much abundance that that cortisol surge just burps out of the pineal gland and then the liver just burps all over their blood sugar. It just rises so much that they aren't gonna burn that much uh, in a, a couple of hours. So it, it is why moving the eating window closer to that morning surge of cortisol, quit eating so late, late at night. I look at your, your cortisol is going to rise every morning. You can't change that. The sun's gonna come up every day. Yeah. I don't care if you're the night shift worker for 30 years, we still see it rise. And you want that by the way. <laughs> you want that, it's part of, that's, that's how your brain works. So to go backwards in time, from that cortisol rise, you can't change that. I need to know how many hours did you have with no calories, mm. which is why that evening meal becomes such a way to just sabotage mm. anybody's good plan. So true. Uh, insulin resistant people need to time backwards from their cortisol surge. And if they're having elevated numbers in the morning, I need you to clean up sundown, no calorie, no no chewing, no gum, no nothing after the sun goes down. If you're in the middle of making your sardine salad and the sun goes down, you need to close it up, put it in the fridge, 
in a Ziploc bag and eat it tomorrow. Don't eat it that day. <laughs> Sardine salad. <laughs> <laughs> So did you, let me get this right. You said it's better to have a bigger meal when your cortisol is high in the morning. Is that what you said? Yeah. So pa patients, one of the other things that uh, over time when they are working on restoring their health, right? That's the whole point of what we're talking about here. Uh, that, that feeling of fullness, that satiation comes from several fat-based hormones that are, are going to surge when you eat a nice fatty, fatty meal. What we're looking at is giving you a surge of that earlier in the day, which will suppress that, you know, that need to eat, that hunger. Many people don't have any desire to eat early in the day because that glucose sent up, mm -hmm. their cortisol was a lot. And I'm like, okay, fine. But the first meal you eat needs to be a hearty meal, which gets you satiated. And I've learned that when I, when I ask patients to start working on that eating window, getting that eating window down to four or five hours instead of eight hours, that if I can get a nice satiating meal with a rise in their leptin and a, a rise in their um, peptide YY, these are fat built uh, or fat responsive hormones. When you eat fat, you feel satiated. The next meal is almost always 70, per, you know, only 70% of what they would have eaten. So cut by 30% naturally. Yeah. So if they say, I'm waiting, I can, I'm not hungry. I'm going to eat at the end of the day they have waited too long. It takes them almost, they, they eat 150% of what they should have eaten. And then the satiation is like, they're like dopamine drunk. They're like, oh, I had so much food. Now I can go to sleep. We've and all been right. there. <laughs> right. And then, right. and then the coffee, you should probably wait an hour and a half and let that cortisol taper down. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I still have mine first thing in the morning. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's how I live through three teenagers and yeah, no, that's a long commute that I have. You get a golden pass. <laughs> Uh, this has been such a great conversation. I'm so glad we made it happen, uh, Dr. Boss. Share with my audience again where they can find you on online and your website and social media. You bet. So bozmd.com is my website. That's where you can find almost everything we do. Uh, uh, YouTube is type in Dr. Boz and you'll find me. Uh, that's really put where I put most of my energy. I've got some little things happening on Instagram. So if you type in Dr. Boz, you'll find me there. But for the most part, I just want to say it is really nice to have such a a hearty conversation with other uh, like sciencey geeks inside this this space. So uh, Ben, thanks for being geeky with me. Yeah, no, I, I love being geeky with you. And uh, your YouTube channel is incredible. It's been a great resource for me over the years. So everybody go subscribe to Dr. Boz's YouTube channel. We'll put that down below, including all of your social media and your website. Uh, I want to acknowledge you and say thank you for your tremendous dedication and devotion to helping people wake up and treat their health with priority. And you do it with such grace and authenticity. And I'm grateful for you, Dr. Boss. So thank you for today. Thank you. God bless you.